a force of nature. Deborah Henson Holt. Her mastery of the heart captivates. Her vocals electrify. Deborah thrills her fans and builds a new fall. Audiences adore her, performing her one-woman shows. I said, you know what? And I said, you know what? what? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Featured as an orchestral soloist. and Conant is a tour de force that must be experienced. Yes, we are here, and it's my big pleasure today to welcome the great guest, as you have already seen on the video, and I'm so glad to be with you. Welcome today to our show, welcome to our interview, and today we have a wonderful jazz harpist, Deborah hansen Conant. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you, I'm, I'm so, so happy to be here with you. I'm so glad to be with you and I'm so sorry for the mistake at the beginning because there was still a, a, like the banner of the previous guest, Annaline Lennart, and there was the first information about her, so I'm so oh, sorry. Oh, no. that's great, you know, uh, but I love her, so that's perfect. <laughs> so only that the people will have not seen that you are from Belgium, as it was mentioned at the very beginning, so you are really from the United States. Deborah, it's how are you? It's really great to see you. How yes, are you? It's wonderful to see you. It's an interesting time for all of us. We're having this interview in the middle of COVID-19. So that is an interesting time, but but I'm actually great because of, of a bunch of different things. For one thing, I began building an online school about five or six years ago. And it's been so incredible to realize what an incredible service that is at this point when people can't get out of their houses. So I while other people are feeling disconnected, I'm feeling very, very connected to my tribe, mm -hmm. to Harpus all around the world. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, this Friday, I am releasing for the first time on streaming media a video called Invention and Alchemy, which is a symphony show that I created about t uh, 15 years ago. This is the first time it will ever be seen streaming live. So I just feel like, you know, in many ways, things are opening up. They're always opening up in, in all of our lives because life is an opening, a constant opening. Mm -hmm. But that is that is how I'm feeling right now. I'm loving the connection that I'm having over the internet and I'm definitely missing the physical <laughs> connection that I'm having in life. I can imagine, and we have already seen in the video, it is really like you are the part of the society, you know, you really need to be on the stage. So I'm so glad you will have this kind of stream. I have the videos from the, uh, and of course the advertisements for the for the coming events. That's you great, are great. beautiful. We can talk about it later, but right. as I would like also to start from your very beginning and everybody okay. is really interested about your past. How did you come to play the harp? Actually, if you came from the family of the musicians or how did you first met the harp? Because I have found some of the pictures with your teacher, but you were already a little bit older. Yes, that's I right. Know. Yeah, so I, I, was, I was 22 when I seriously started the harp. So mm -hmm. as a kid, I played the ukulele and I played the guitar and I played the piano and I always wanted to write music and create music. And um, my parents tried to give me lessons. You know, they tried to give me guitar lessons and I didn't like the guitar lessons and they tried to give me flute lessons, I think. And I was like, I didn't like the lessons. So they were like, aha, well, give her harp lessons because my mother was in music school and she had all these friends who were, you know, music teachers. So. I took a harp lesson and I didn't like the harp either. Actually, I think I had about six lessons. And at that point was when that, that is me and my mom, right? <laughs> <laughs> that it, well, that is it. The phase when I really love trains. You can see that I'm wearing a, an outfit. There's two things going on there: trains. I really love trains, and you're also seeing that I am wearing a necklace. 
that is made of pop beads. And these are beads that all fit together. And that's actually a really important theme in my life that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, and you can see me trying to act sophisticated like my mom wearing her glasses. Um, but when, uh, but after my parents heard that I didn't like the harp lessons, at that moment they realized, okay, she doesn't like lessons. Mm -hmm. And so they left me alone and I started combining stories and music. That's what I love is music and stories and music. And so I did that and I did that and did that, was writing musicals and performing musicals. And then when I was 22, I was in college and my college needed a harpist. Mm -hmm. And I had had those six lessons as a child. And so I had the greatest experience of anyone in the school mm -hmm. with those six mm -hmm. lessons. And uh, I started with a teacher named Linda Wood, Linda mm -hmm. Wood Rollo. And she really was the person who changed me from a completely self-taught musician into somebody who could learn from someone else. And mm -hmm. it was because of her teaching and, and because she respected me as a composer and mm -hmm. really encouraged me to be composing straight from the beginning as well as teaching me the basics of technique. So it is because of her that I am a harpist today, as a, as opposed to, to something else, that That's began right. me on you know learning the instrument. Mm -hmm. But then I started feeling I, I I learned classical music. I began to feel somewhat constrained by that, and so I looked to jazz as a way of breaking out. And I started playing jazz, and and then after it was it was great. I mean, it was beautiful. I loved playing with other people. I got signed to a label. I was touring all around the world. But I realized that two things were problematic for me. One was that I was touring with a concert harp and it was very difficult. I didn't have the mobility. It, it was, I was spending all my time thinking, how do I get my harp from here to there? How do we get a harp that's playable? So there was that. And then the other problem was I wasn't expressing my full self. Mm -hmm. I was very, I love my, I love playing, you know, I love my fingers being able to sing, but me, I am a storyteller and a singer as well as a harpist. The harp is a platform for my personal expression and, and an incredible platform, a beautiful, I think of it as a, as a part of my voice now. It has become mm -hmm. me. But that, when I realized that, I had to make a big shift. And that was very scary because it's easy to hide behind technique. And I had developed a lot of, you know, fast classical techniques and then pulled them over into jazz and I was, you know, fast. And I really relied on that. And I had to, I had to pull back from that and really start expressing myself. And at that time, it was not a smooth transition because when you start finding your authentic voice, it's often a raw, very raw voice. And it can often feel like, well, that's not any good. This was way better but that way better was when I was hiding, hiding behind the technique. And so I made that transition. And through the transition, I also collaborated with Camac mm -hmm. Harps mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. um, to build a harp that I could be totally mobile with. It was this idea of mobility, to be able to move, to be able to move myself, to, to move through music, yes. to move with the music, in every sense of that word, to make them so that the music is moving and so I am moving with the music because I constantly felt constrained behind mm -hmm. the instrument. And the, my journey with Kamak Harps was incredible. What a beautiful partnership. And, and I have a TEDx talk that talks mm -hmm. all about that journey of the instrument. Mm -hmm. Yes, and because you went like very fast through all your journey, but right. I know a little bit more about that your grandmother yes. was the, <laughs> who was playing the ukulele, right? Which you were mentioning. Well, and that she, yeah, and what were you going to say? And she what? She she was actually the one who brought you into the music, probably. Well, it was well, my mother and my grandmother. So this mm -hmm. this woman is very very important. I had two sides of my family. My mm -hmm. grandma. Anna and my grandmother Edith. And Anna was from Russia and where the arts were, you know, 
God, goddesses, artists are goddesses. Mm -hmm. And so I got that side of, of, of knowing that art is a magical opening to a new world. But mm -hmm. Edith was Swedish and she was from a farming background. And mm -hmm. Edith said to me, people have to sing. It's a thing they have to do. Like they have to eat, they have to drink water, they have to you know, move and they have to sing. And somebody has to keep them together. And that's the reason to play music. Oh, I have this fun. It's so lovely. It's a wonderful set. Yeah, so there, so there were two sides. There was the side in which music was elevated, and there was the side in which music is in service of community. Mm -hmm. And those two sides are a really deeply important part. Mm -hmm. And and when I'm on stage, I I love being on stage. I feel so free there. And I also, my job, I feel like my job is to be an ambassador mm -hmm. to the world of imagination and music. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm on the stage is to open up that world. Yeah, because also, also I was reading your biography a little bit more deeply and also your posts at the Facebook. And there you have once posted also that you moved with your mother to your aunt because your parents uh, d uh, divorced when you were yes. very little. Right, that's right. Yeah, we moved. Yeah, so so my my uh, my mother and I, when my parents divorced mm -hmm. when I was little, I mm -hmm. actually got sent to live with my other grandmother with with Anna, and oh. then and then my mother and I went to live with my father's mother, <laughs> and then my mother and I went to live with my aunt. So we 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 moved around a lot, but in every single place. Mm -hmm there was music and in every single place there were instruments. And so there was that connection between mm -hmm. the human and the instrument that is to me is so powerful. I, I mean, I know animals are a really powerful connection for human mm -hmm. beings. Like the dog is man's best friend and cat is whatever. But, um, but an instrument mm -hmm. is, is a voice that is just waiting to sing with you. Absolutely. And you, you not only sing with the instrument, you sing also by yourself when you play. So that's right. Really right. The, that's right. Yeah. We come to it and uh, I just found this picture. It is also you with your mother. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And you know, this picture is really important because it plays a part in a song. There's a song that I sing um, called Congratulations, You Made It This Far. And it's a song that I wrote for my 40th birthday. And in the middle of it, it has this, um, it has this section where it says, you know, on your birthday, you know, when you're feeling like you, it's, it's not what you want, you know, go to the mirror and look into the mirror. Don't be afraid. You know, okay, your eyes are sitting in an older face. But those eyes are the eyes of a child. And that mm. child, that is the child that has been with me every step of the way. And that child has, has, has been with me. And that child needs to hear me say, congratulations. You oh, made it this far. Oh, this is so wonderful. This is so lovely. I have also here a picture of your father. I just can't find it because it's so many pictures. I downloaded and I now I can find. Here we are. Here is your yeah, hate. And uh, that was a really unusual time of being with him. Um, that was actually at his wedding. And I was the flower girl for his wedding when he got married for the second time. And that's that is one of the only pictures that I have of my father and me as a, oh. as a little girl. Yeah. But if your father or your mother, they were not musicians like professionally. They only loved the music. Well, my mother was a professional musician and my father might have been a professional musician. He mm -hmm. really loved music and they, mm -hmm. but he became, uh, he became a lawyer and he, and he got into politics. That's what he also really loved. Mm -hmm. What's important is that their relationship was all about music. Mm -hmm. So I know, and I know that they courted by singing to each other. Now that doesn't mean they were able to have a relationship, but mm -hmm. but in their courtship they sang. And I so I know that the first sounds that I ever heard in the womb were the sounds of my parents singing. Probably mm -hmm. also the sounds of my parents fighting. You know, so those two <laughs> things were probably there. But um, so the sound of being alive mm -hmm. is the sound of human beings mm -hmm. singing. Mm -hmm. 
But as you said that both of your parents came from the different countries and they yeah. they, they were already Americans or they moved also she, Yeah, they were my mother was first generation, my father was many generations. That his family mm -hmm. had been here for a long time. Okay, so you were born in America already. You yes, were born, correct. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Where, and where have you been born exactly? Oh, I was born in California in a uh, in a town called Stockton. I, I didn't really live there. I mean, I moved every year of my life until I got to high school. And then I, I still kept moving. And so that's why I will not move now. I will stay where I am. It's so funny because so many people talk about traveling and how much they want to travel. And I'm like, no. I mean, I love to travel for work. I love playing with people. But the idea of traveling for a vacation, it's just like, are you kidding? A vacation is like get in the bathtub and just stay there. I can imagine. And your mom, did she have any connection with Mexico? <laughs> well, I know, I know, I know. I'm I I really love Mexico and I loved Mexico ever since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother I, I think she went to Tijuana once and and I and I knew about that. There was just something amazing to me about what came out of Mexico. So I lived Every summer I lived in the San Joaquin Valley, which is um, a farming community, and there are a lot of Mexicans there. Mm -hmm. And I just, it's just that I felt that there was this life force that came from them that wasn't in the community that I was in. And it just seemed like this magical, and I think I, you know, I felt like I heard that music. And, um, and, and I love, you know, the hats and the everything. So yeah, that is from a story in which a sombrero, a beautiful sombrero falls in love with my mother. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. not saying this happened. And basically it became my father, you know, my surrogate father, this hat. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I feel like that kind of happened to me. You know, right now I'm just looking on the other side of the room and I'm like, well, I have a sombrero right over there. <laughs> That's wonderful. And I have a surprise for you, which I prepared. Okay. You remember that you were in Prague at the World Harp Congress when I invited you to perform there. And you performed with the Mexican harpist. Uh-huh. Yeah, Mercedes Gomez. Yes. You performed your piece, which yes. is commissioned by Kamak, which we were talking Right, which I wrote and for I, her and me. Yes. And I have made a video from that concert. So oh. we will be now hearing the oh first my. movement of that concerto from that concert. So wait a minute. I will take you out of the screen now and I will bring out the bring in the, the video from that. <laughs>
we are. <laughs> oh, I love that. I was dancing. I, you know, Kamek um, commissioned that piece, and uh, and it, for Mercedes and I, and this, and I loved writing it. And that, in a sense, that first movement was kind of like an introduction to the rest of it. And I was, I was, it was in Prague, and I had heard that the horn, that the brass sections in Prague were great. And so when I wrote it, I really focused on writing a lot for the brass instruments. And wow, it's just so great to hear that again. The second movement that comes after that is a movement called Merceditas. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote it for that concerto, but then I wrote it, and I wrote it as a double concerto, but then I re- invented it as a single concerto. And now that is the piece that now that, that is an invention and in alchemy and it's part of another mm -hmm. concerto. Um, it, it's And Mercedes was just so inspiring to me. I've been so inspired by different harpists and but the chance to play with her and she actually invited me down to Mexico to learn mm -hmm. to do the Zapate auto dancing. So the foot dancing and um, and that became part of the third movement of mm -hmm. this piece. And um, just having that relationship with her was just so beautiful to be able to create this thing and to be able to share it with her. And share so with her. I just wanted to make an example because this was the shortest uh, movement. The other ones were longer right. and you can't download more than five minutes and it was exactly 10 seconds before five minutes. Okay, good. So that's why I didn't want to take only part of it. So I wanted that everybody will enjoy the whole piece, like that's in right. the whole couple. Well, you know, it's what's interesting. What's interesting about that is, as I recall, it's not actually that technically difficult for the harps. Mm -hmm. it, because I wanted to start the concerto with something that was, you know, we could get warmed up on. And the second movement was much harder. And mm -hmm. I was just thinking, wow, that that's actually something that, that could be played much more, and I, I haven't published it or anything, but it's a it's a fun piece. And you have never played it before after my I mean after Prague. Oh, no. what is because no. I have so many comments here, and the people are just excited about that. So I just will only share it so that the people will know that we know about them. Thank you so much for being really with us again. It's really lovely. Oh, so that's great. Well, the beautiful thing is that people can actually see other works like that and that were inspired and they can see the second movement in on, on july 10th in the mm -hmm. invention and alchemy which it and it'll it'll be streaming for a little while they'll mm -hmm. actually get to see you know what happens and and see the visuals as well which yeah, is great. Exactly. but it should be really played because the people really enjoy here's also a wonderful message from from my assistant oh wow, that's great takes you as a big admirer big inspiration and it's really true and we have here, of course, a fantastic concerto. We have the common Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, well, I mean, my dream was to write concertos for harpists to play. Mm -hmm. And because I, when I became, when I first came to the harp, I felt I was, it was missing a, a certain repertoire. It was missing this like, you know, exactly. dramatic re repertoire. And so now, but it's very hard for me to write out the harp mm -hmm. part because I'm mm -hmm. always inventing it. And mm -hmm. so um, it, it's, yeah, it's great when people are telling me they like it because then I'm more likely to do I'm that. I'm sure that you can, it's written here also the question of where it is published. If it, it, is. it, it isn't, it isn't published. Baroque flamenco, however, which which is which is a concerto that is published and people can mm -hmm. play that it's, it's different from this one um, mm -hmm. and this one was also for a huge brass section that I know a, a lot of symphonies may not have but absolutely get in touch with me at hipharp.com and ask me if you want to perform any of my music I might not be fast in getting back to you but just keep getting in touch absolutely I have here also prepared banners so that you can really see the the, the, oh, that's great! So that right. you can, of course, get in contact with Deborah, and it will be really great if you, if it's possible that this concerto can be played because there are not so many concertos for two harps, and this is such a such an amazing thing, you know, that uh, you can actually it's really totally unique. Yeah, you know that's right. I, I hadn't really thought about that that there mm -hmm. are not that many concertos mm -hmm. for two harps. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. sure that the people would really love to hear it. So right. I just. But I and play it. I mean, play it. Right. Play it. Well, you know, part part of the problem that's very difficult for me, and this goes back to my past, and 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 this is where I think I need partnership in this. Is mm -hmm. I did not grow up reading music, and I certainly did not grow up reading harp music. So I often it's it's very difficult for me to write it. I'm changing the part each time, and so I really need to partner 
in order to get it, like all the all the music for all the rest of the instruments is all you know mm -hmm. publishable. But the hard part is often just sketches, and mm -hmm. I really would need. I would love to have a partnership with a harpist who wanted to help me codify those so that I could publish more because I have entire shows of harp with symphony orchestra and everything that I write, almost everything I write for symphony orchestra is also playable in a specific chamber ensemble. So mm -hmm. I, I write always for the same chamber ensemble, which mm -hmm. is string quartet, bass, flute, clarinet. Does it sound familiar? It's oh, the same. And, yeah. and, and percussion. So it is, a, it is the chamber ensemble that was used for uh, in right. Ravel, Ravel's an introduction and Allegro. Mm -hmm. And when I started writing chamber music, I decided I wanted to always use the same ensemble so that harpists could create an entire program of music that included the Ravel and all these other pieces. That's fantastic. Oh, it's, it is. Everybody would love to have that because it's- I, really I would love it too. <laughs> it's it's a hard, it's writing out those heart parts that's so hard and that's and that's the partnership that I need and I find in my life that and this is why my project is called invention and alchemy that individuals may have inventiveness and we may be clever and whatever but in fact in order to do anything big we need collaboration and alchemy you can see that entire symphony orchestra that is the alchemy that brings the music alive in this way. Certainly I can get on stage and I can perform solo and that's really fun. But what happens when I play, when I collaborate, when I'm with a partner who brings their skills, their life, what they love, then you can see that something new, you know, bubbles out of that, that I could never have imagined myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, I'm working with a harpist who, so I have a piece called Baroque Flamenco that's pretty famous. No, 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 no. Um, yeah. and, and, and now that I'm publishing it for a harpist to play with symphony orchestra, I made a piano reduction so that they could practice it. And now a harpist who was going to be playing it this year and can't because of COVID-19, she is now turning the piano reduction into a second harp part so that it can be played together like that. Super, that's yeah. wonderful also to know. And I would like to know more about the Baroque Flamenco, but we have now the guest, because oh. as we are still having the guest from the daily quiz, which was going on in June, and we have a winner, Ala Lemyshenko, who is a, actually the mother of Veronika Lemyshenko. So I would like to bring her in. Sure. Welcome her. Hello, Ala, it's Hi. nice to see you. Hello, hello. <laughs> It's wonderful to see you. I will leave you now alone. And I will leave you now alone. And you are welcome to ask two questions to our guest. Okay. Hello. So you much for this opposition, Diana. And uh, dear Deborah, I want to thank you. Special thanks for your Father's Day live concert. My, our daughter Veronica uh, made a uh, surprise. Oh. And... Uh, Congrats and song for my husband Yuri. <laughs> it was amazing, and we was really shocked. Okay. <laughs> and um, on that day, you um, talk about your parents and how you uh, told them you don't want to be a classical harpist and want to play jazz. And um, so my first question is: Who of jazz musicians influenced you to begin of your uh, musical? Korea. There was a man who my mother used to go listen to, and I'm I'm probably going to forget his name right now, but he was a cellist, and he played with a group called the Chico Hamilton Quintet. And maybe someone will remember who the cellist is. Maybe maybe someone maybe um, Yana can Google this while we're doing this. I'm, I'm suddenly forgetting his name, but I heard him playing in a jazz context. And a man named Ken Nordine had something called word jazz, where he was talking and there was jazz behind him. So there was story and music. And these two people who, also, who worked together, they mm -hmm. were a huge influence on me. You wouldn't think that, you know, because I'm a harpist, and, but 
But that, what was important to me about that was that my mother said to me, she went to a jazz club and this cello was playing this solo line and in this big busy jazz club, everyone was silent and you could hear a pin drop because of bringing this new voice in to the jazz, the cello. And that's what told my brain, you can take any instrument into the jazz context and you can bring your sensibility in. So I can play jazz, but I can also bring me to jazz. I can bring jazz to me, but I can bring me to jazz. So that's probably a different answer than you were expecting. But it's 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 what's it's what's true for me. Okay, thank you so much. And my second question: What is your favorite movie? Oh wow, that's <laughs> such a great question. I didn't even think about that. My favorite movie. Wow, yeah. uh, <laughs> wow, this is oh boy. I am completely drawing a blank. My favorite movie, a movie that I would watch over and over again. Well, I don't know if this is my, f if I would watch this over and over, but there's a movie called Brother from Another Planet. And it's about um, a man who comes from another dimension and he can talk to machines with, with his hands. And I think, Maybe that's why I loved that movie so much, that someone can listen with his hands and can listen. I'm just realizing this as you ask me that. I feel like the harp is a machine, especially the concert harp. It's this beautiful machine for making music. And I get to sing with it. But this man was listening with his hands. And I think that's why I loved that movie so much. That's Thank a great you so question. Much. You're so welcome. I'm so happy that you were here. I'm happy, happy. Thank you for you and for Jana for this great product. Very interesting and uh, uh, the support uh, great, great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. So. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much for your great questions. I love <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, this is lovely. That's great. And she was talking about my Facebook live concerts. I started doing them every Sunday at 4.30 once COVID-19 started. And it's been really interesting. Sometimes I can't get online because there's a thunderstorm and, and mm -hmm. you know, so it's, there's always those technical problems. But the other thing we started setting up was uh, for the Father's Day and Mother's Day concert was that people could send messages to me that I would then read on the screen. And I, I really love doing that. I can imagine absolutely. I have seen also some of the photos, and I will bring them in. I just only I just found it very funny because you wrote DHC, and I, actually the harp channel is THC. So I just now put into my name the oh. THC. Oh, that's <laughs> great! That's perfect. That's so perfect. Yeah. Similar now with our titles, but we have also many wonderful again wonderful messages. I just want to bring them. In so that the people really love the Baroque flamenco. Oh, yes, it's a very popular and very loving piece. I love it as well. I have never played it by myself, but I really, I, I know that all my students adore it. It's not no, this is from myself. I just wanted to thanks to Veronica because she brought the information about Fred the cats. Fred yeah. cats. That's right. <laughs> yes, he was amazing, amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. He was so influential to me mm -hmm. because that, that said to my brain, you can take a classical instrument and you can bring it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It belongs anywhere. Now that anywhere might then change it, but <laughs> it can start where it start with it. And tell me the Baroque flamenco, did you, did you uh, compose on this little harp already or no. on the big harp? Oh no. So Baroque flamenco, it starts with a theme by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Mm -hmm. And, it, and I, many of you, I don't know if you, let's see if this is turn, plugged in. Um, there's a little book, remember I started as an adult and, mm -hmm. I, and I immediately had to make a living because I had to pay for my instrument. Mm -hmm. And but I could only play like four songs. And so um, one of them was from this book and it was this little,
you may remember it, you know, if you've, if you've played from that book. And, um, and then it had a really beautiful, um, and this, this harp is, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Harp is never in tune. Um, it, had an, it had a contrasting section that went, I wanna make sure people can see my hands. It had a contrasting section that went something like this. And so it had this descending bass line. And as I was playing in this restaurant, I uh, played my four songs, because that's all I could play, and I played them again. And then the, um, the wait this waiter came over, very cute waiter, and he had a pitcher of water and he said, if you play those four songs again, I'm pouring this pitcher of water in your lap. No. I so, well, <laughs> so I realized I was gonna have to expand each of these songs. Mm -hmm. And so I looked and as a composer, I have a, always have a composer's brain. And so I was looking, okay, that's a descending bass line. Okay, so I could improvise over that a lot more. I could do it for a long time. And when I get lost or when I think that maybe people think I don't know what I'm doing, then I come back and I'm like, oh, sure. <laughs> I play this melody. So, and then I realized, well, if I'm going A and G and F and E, I could go A and A and G and G and F and F and E. I could make it longer. I could go A, 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 A and G. And F and E. And then I started thinking, well, wait a minute. These are contrasting sections. How can I make them even more contrasted? I could go A and G and F and E and then A and G and F and E. And then I thought, what I could stay on that E. E. And I could go, I could really have fun with it. And then I thought, wait a minute, I could be dramatic with it. And then I thought, you know, so it just kept going bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. The harp is just a big drum. Then I could do percussion. Or, or you know, hit the soundboard, which you'll see. And so the piece grew and it grew and it grew over time. And then always at the center. So always coming back to that heart of my, you know, of my first song that I loved on the harp mm -hmm. and then building it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you see it with symphony orchestra, it's just like, it's really big. Absolutely. No, bravo. It is so wonderful. And of course, in your interpretation, it is something totally different. You know, it's fantastic. Just tell me, because this is this uh, version of technique, it's not normal for playing the harp. It is like for the classical harp. So, Right. How did, you, how did you come to, of course, in, in the Paraguay harps or in sure. the Mexican harps, it is like that. So you have been inspired by that or how did you come to use this? Um, I wanted the experience as a woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, the harp is an important instrument as a woman because it's seen as a woman's instrument. But it was also very immobile, very pretty, but unmoving and mm -hmm. soft and not dramatic in the repertoire that I first was given when I started playing it. And I was, where is the dramatic? Where is, how can I express myself like this other side of me? And so when I built Baroque flamenco, I wanted to feel, I, I love the images of a flamenco dancer, everything in her body, everything that she is, all the power and the rhythm that she has, but I didn't want to learn how to flamenco dance. <laughs> so I wanted to be, can I do this on the harp? Can I be, now this harp doesn't have a soundboard. So, and, and the original um, has, you know, it's, and the slap. Right. And, and that's part of what, you know, just gets very loud. And then, um, so what I was doing was trying to reinvent flamenco, the flamenco experience. 
I didn't go back to flamenco. A real flamenco player would be like, that's not flamenco. Mm -hmm. It's the flamenco experience. And that's what my job, our job is as artists is to give the audience this experience through what we're doing. And so that's just what I thought about. Like I wanted the I wanted the feet, I wanted to hear, I wish I could show you what it's like on the on the pedal harp. I, I have one over there, but it, it's, I haven't tuned it for a long time. Um, but, but there's just these slapping, you can see it in Invention and Alchemy, it was just like dum dum bum so that you get the experience of building that up. Mm -hmm. And then it come, the orchestra comes back in and it's just like, boo, like this. So did I answer your question or did I just go off on a little tangent? No, no I just wanted to know how did you come like for this technique? Because this right. I, yeah, I didn't, well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's strings, so it's strummable, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I, and so, I mean, I, it just seemed obvious, but then, so that's a fun technique. How, and how do you make music out of it? Mm -hmm. And then how do you, and the whole idea of a cadenza. I just, I love the, the feeling of a cadenza. How can you push that? How can you push it more? How can you push it more? How, so you, as musicians, when you think about harmony, one of the beautiful things about harmony is that it all starts with a single note. Like let's say it's a D and then you, we build in thirds and that's a third, a tri and then we build more, that's a triad, a seventh, a ninth, an 11th, a 13th, you know, so there is expansion. Mm -hmm. That is a principle of, of harmony is expansion. Another principle of harmony is all to alter something. So when we come to a seven chord, we can have a flat nine, or we can have a sharp, a sharp four, a sharp five. So we, anything in the world, we can expand, we can alter, or we can substitute. So if you're, I don't know if I can do this. Let's see if I can do this on this. So that's just a two, five, one, like D minor seven, and then G seven, and then C. So let's see if I can do this. So I can do G minor seven, then B flat seven, and then C. That's a substitution. So those three principles, and I, I outline all this, I have a class called Hands on Harmony that just takes you through all this. But these are principles that come outside of music as well that you can start from any point and you can build, you can expand, you can alter, or you can substitute. And if you have those three principles, you can start from any place mm -hmm. and you can get, you can expand into, I mean, you can transform where you are. That's fantastic. I just want, wonder, did you ever study the uh, composing, composing or you just... <laughs> um, I, well, I did, I did, I think a lot about, about this and, and I have a, an academy, the Hip Harp Academy, where I'm teaching improvisation and harmony and the skills mm -hmm. and the students have helped me break it down by their questions. But I did study composition and conducting in at UC Berkeley. And then I studied also with, uh, with a composer afterwards to just kind of help me break things down. Um, and, but I'm just fascinated by it. I mean, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. And, and, and harmony, even just the difference between playing in a, in a major key and then going down to the minor key. That's just a whole world. But then it goes to the minor. And sometimes you can find a chord that is just like, like, I love that chord. It's just everything could come out of that chord and I could cry just listening to that chord. And then when you change the bass line, that changes, you know, that just changing the foundation, the fundamental, it changes everything. So I, 
I'm fascinated with harmony. That's amazing. And I, maybe you have not seen it, but I already posted this. This, this yes. is the, the academy which you are doing for, for, right. uh, for the improvisation. That's right. And this is a specific um, class is hands on harmony. So mm -hmm. people, there are different ways that people can work with me. And one mm -hmm. is to study for a year in the academy uh, mm -hmm. where you're getting improv and you're in a community actually learning. Another is people can take individual classes mm -hmm. and then there, there people can also study privately. That had just the last person I was working with on a one to one was just before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And we she was here from um, from South Korea and we literally had to do the lessons in in masks mm -hmm. and stay. We had to have two separate harps mm -hmm. and um, just not not touch each other. Yeah. And, which is hard and heart and heart playing because we, we you know your teacher's always touching so um there are those three different levels that people can work with me mm -hmm. and I, i also have a mentorship program if people if i love to help people build their own career and their own show their own thing mm -hmm. and i have a mentorship program called harness your muse that's specifically for doing that so Perfect. i love it i mean i love i love learning Mm -hmm. and i and i love teaching that's wonderful and you are going to have also the academy as i have seen this this uh, link is it going to be this academy now uh, or online or, or how do you well the, the academy you? so the academy is already online and that mm -hmm. is and that is a series of classes that runs through the year and mm -hmm. so so for example this summer in about two weeks we are going to be uh, i'm doing a, a a class called Jazz for Harps. And it's where people learn how to get inside jazz tunes and learn how to make the roadmaps. And then in the fall, we learn about arrangement. And then in the beginning of the year, we learn about create creativity and how to express that. So there's a curriculum that runs throughout the year. And so there are probably about, a maybe about 120 students in the academy now. Mm -hmm. And everyone's learning together. It's people of different levels because they're learning concepts. And what I discovered is that often the more advanced students will learn from the less advanced students because the less advanced students are not so caught mm -hmm. in ideas. And it's all about improvisation, um, arrangement, and learning to express yourself and learning to liberate yourself from the notes mm -hmm. on the page. That's great. And every information they can find on this link, which is there now. Uh, on uh, the not, not this link, but if they go to hipharp.com, like That's hip, right. hip, this hip harp. Yeah, exactly. Hip, exactly. They can they can go there and you can see the academy and you can, and you can always just email me as well and ask me about it. Okay. That's right. and, it's, and this is actually a great time for people to start it. It's always mm -hmm. the best time to start the academy is when either when we're in between classes like we are now or mm -hmm. just when we're starting a new class. Fantastic. Certainly go. If there is option like this, I would go as a student absolutely immediately. We have again some, of course, with Marisa Robles, who is with us again. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, she invited me to the World Harp Festival. Yes, and Marisa, I also remember you um, from the Edinburgh Harp Festival as well and your amazing work there. Yeah, Marisa is a really amazing lady and uh, such an honor that she's always with us. And uh, thank you so much, Marisa, for being yes, with us. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and we have here also about your, of course, your compositions that they really love you playing this piece. Oh. If anybody is playing my pieces, let me know. And especially if you put it on YouTube, let me know so that I can share that. And I have also a special program for people who are playing Baroque flamenco. I have a set of interview questions. And when you answer, they're all about your experience of learning it. And then I make a blog post out of that so that people can share with each other what their experience was. So definitely get in touch with me. Let me know. Fantastic. That. And I have here also the... Uh... Uh, information or question that yes. uh, your double concert, which I have put there as a sem sample of the first movement, there is a question if there where they can hear the whole version. Well, I the whole version. You have it. If you allow me to post it, I would be very happy to do so. I am totally happy with that. I don't know about the orchestra. 
so I don't think that they they will well I can of course ask them but I don't yeah. think that there will be something against it but I will oh, that would be beautiful I would love you to do that I would love to share it I the final movement oh I mean it is just I I really really love it well I love the whole thing and and the other, the other reason I love it is that when you hear the second movement the way I originally wrote it, mm -hmm. and then you hear it now when I actually filled it out a whole bunch more, I think mm -hmm. it's really fun to hear how pieces develop. They they're not always they don't always come out you know like perfect. Mm -hmm. And they are always different, especially yeah, when that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, and when you, so Baroque flamenco when I first wrote it for symphony orchestra, mm -hmm. after every single performance. I would listen and I would rewrite it. I think I rewrote it about 10 times until I finally had the version that I wanted. And then orchestras asked me to please um, make the orchestration smaller so that it could be done with pairs of winds and brass. And so I, I rewrote it again so that, it can, so that it's easier to play. That's amazing. And because you did, as you said, on the big harp, on the concert harp, where did you change to this little harp? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so I was touring, you know, the world, and it was just really hard with the big harp. And mm -hmm. I began to realize if I want to have a lifelong career as a performer with this instrument, it, it's not going to work. I can't mm -hmm. be spending my time and my money yeah. getting that harp around. I need to have a harp that I can wear. Mm -hmm. And I made a prototype. I think I. Uh, Oh, I can, I can show it, it's in the other room, I think. I don't know where it is. Anyway, I made a prototype. I took it to, to, to Joël Garnier, who was the president of Camac Harps and one of the world's, probably the world's visionary harpist. And I showed it to him and I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to wear it and I want to do this and this. And he was like, ah, Deborah, now I understand what you want. And mm -hmm. he then created the first prototype of that mm -hmm. instrument, mm -hmm. which I have in the other room too. And, um, and then I was able to tour with my harp. Now, I see how you're touring. Right, that's right. My goal was my big goal. I want to be able to get with two bag, two bags, and and a carry on. I want to be able to go anywhere in the world. And now I can do that. And um, however, as you know, I mean, I had spent decades learning the technique of the concert harp, and I love harmony and changing harmonies. Changing to this harp was very tricky. Mm. And I really, I feel like every year I'm just starting to get it. And mm. but one of the things I discovered on this, every instrument has its limitations and every instrument has its windows. And what's so, um, one of the things that's so amazing about this instrument is what it sounds like in the blues and what it makes available because you can tune it in different you can make different tunings in different parts of the instrument and you can oh and yeah well i mean you can do that on any harp but this um th that those bending and, and in the blues, it, it just, this instrument is so open mm -hmm. to that. The other thing that's really interesting um, and is I started using a looper. And you can also tune this instrument in, like you can tune different octaves mm -hmm. in different keys. So for example, let's see. Um, if I can... So in this piece, which I use a looper on, I've tuned this upper, whoops, it's in E, here it's in, I think it's in G, and then down here it's in C. And by doing that, I'm able to get something that has um, a lot of, it just allowed me to do some really cool things, including, um, let's see if, let's see if I can, oh yeah. Let me see if I can loop this for you. 
I mean, Can I, you, is it this one or this is a very old one which you have used before? No, uh, no, that's that's. <laughs> so what I did that is a, a rack. So what that means, I, I have this right now, right at my feet. I have something very similar to that. Yeah, that is a looper. And what I did is I created a um, something that I could put on the floor where I could put all the effects that I needed to have mm -hmm. so that I could just pull it out of the harp and I could put it on the floor when I go to do a gig. And, and so, so what you're seeing, that pink one there is a looper pedal. And um, I need to put some shoes on in order to play it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and I don't have shoes on right now, so let me put some shoes on for a sec. This is one of the beautiful things of uh, <laughs> doing interviews at home. Actually, I only need to put one shoe on. Oh, that's interesting. Huh? Okay. Well, I might put two shoes on just <laughs> to, just to make it equal. All right. Okay. Almost got two shoes. No, you know, I'm just gonna put one shoe on. Okay, that's better. That's easier. Okay, so I can loop. I can loop this. Like if I go. Mm -hmm. So I'm not playing that anymore, and I can play over it. I can even put a little bit of distortion on it. Or more distortion. And then I, you can hear it in two keys. So the looper allows, um, so the harp allows to be playing in two different keys at once, and the looper, uh, the looper allows the overlay, um, which then, um, and it, it was, it's, it's been an incredible journey, you know, first of all, to have this instrument, and then to be able to utilize a lot of the equipment that mm -hmm. normally only guitar players use. Mm -hmm. but, it, but all of it was there, they developed all of it, and I could just come right in and take it over. And the things that I use are really just a looper pedal and mm -hmm. a distortion pedal, because I didn't want to get into a whole bunch of different things, but those are the ones that, um, that just g give a little bit more voice to the instrument. That's fantastic. And you you use usually the also the band, right? To use yeah. the right, right. I have um well if I put my other shoe on, just a second. Because in case you, you are moving, can you still push the pedals? Yes. Oh, very much so. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, let me put let me put the shoe on. <laughs> two shoes. Amazingly, two shoes. All right. <laughs> harder to put the shoes on than you'd think. All right, so um, I'll put this on. So I'll take it off the stand. Now these shoes are not very comfortable, I'll tell you. <laughs> I couldn't find my comfortable shoes. That was the one thing it's I couldn't find. Nice. Actually, the, the polish of the harp, it's very interesting. Because well, it's yeah. And this is, this is a little bit hard to do with headphones on, by the way. And I don't know if you can hear the harp with headphones. Can is it? Can you hear it okay? Uh, not really. It's we can hear it, but not as much as if you don't have the okay. ear. Okay. Can I can I take this out for a second Absolutely. and just give it a try? Absolutely. So I don't, I don't know what this sounds like. Um, I don't know what my voice sounds like. And it's good. It's okay. Fine. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so if I'm doing, um, let's see. Okay, so there's another song. Um, it's really, I don't know how loud this will get, but this. Okay, that was buzzing. Oops. Okay. Let me just take this off. Thank you. 
because you can never tell, but um, it, it, it has been incredible to have the looper and to then learn, I mean, at first, whenever you get any new technique, you just, you know, just like you just play with the technique, but after a while, you're able to make music with it and you're able to make an arc of meaning and emotion. Mm -hmm. Which is what's mm -hmm. important to me is to make that arc of meaning and emotion. And you can see, I mean, here I am, I mean, I can, I can move. I mean, I can, I can, it's, it is like the harp is attached mm -hmm. to me at some point and I can move and I can go down and I can, it, it's a workout. It's I should have like, it's a workout morning. <laughs> No, it's fantastic and it sounds great. And you are really like connected. You are like a one body, you know, with the instrument. It's fantastic. Well, that was, that was what was important to me is to have mobility and connection mm -hmm. so that it's, it's like a centaur or it's, I, I call it two different things, something like a prosthetic, meaning this is, this is the voice that my hands were born without. My hands had no voice. And now with this instrument, I have, my hands have a voice and the instrument has a voice. So when we, when we're our instrument, we are, it is symbiotic. It has no voice. Mm -hmm. Until you touch it and then, and then we listen, to listen, to sing, sing. And then we're singing together. Mm -hmm. And it is a beautiful, beautiful partnership. That's amazing. That's amazing. Maybe, maybe I ask you to put now the earphone because I hear myself as an echo. So, <laughs> but of course, I know like, like, that's really it would be lovely if you can, of course, take them off again. Yes. Yeah. 
And we I hear, of course, again, beautiful messages, which I want to share. Even I shared them already during your playing, but I think that you should see them. There is written that you are my idol. Kisses from Argentina. Wow. Oh, uh, thank you. It's fantastic and beautiful music, which is absolutely true. All of it, it's very true. So, <laughs> And there is also a message that uh, would be great if the whole concerto can be really posted and it will be that she's very that would be beautiful. That'll be beautiful. We should do that together. And I mean, I wish we had video of it. It was, it was, it, what, what, what was part of what was really exciting about it mm -hmm. is that the first two movements were with concert harps. Mm -hmm. And the third movement was with the first time that the, it wasn't a DHC, but it was before the DHC, but that mm -hmm. the wearable harps were mm -hmm. on stage with a symphony mm -hmm. orchestra. Mm -hmm. And and we started from the back of the hall and walked forward. And what's funny is that we were foot dancing and I don't think people could actually see us do, doing that. I don't think they realized we were doing that. So the orchestra would be bum, 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 And we'd go bum. So Mercedes and I were dancing and and I worked for months to do that dance. But I think, you know, we hadn't thought about the fact that the stage was so high, nobody could see what we were doing with our feet. So they're like, okay, so there's percussion and there's percussion, like who cares? And so this was, this was a great lesson to me that you really need to make sure that the audience can see what you're doing as well as hear it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. But I'm so sorry that this concerto has not been played afterwards. And actually, I'm so proud that it has been played in Prague. You know, so yes, and that, yes. But the the thing is that I don't know if any video exists of it. I have really only. I, I don't think so. I don't think there is. Um, but but I will say that this, the the second movement mm -hmm. has gone on to have a very big life, mm -hmm. and and is actually has become the second movement of a piece for which Baroque flamenco is the third movement. And so now people can play the full, it's called Soñando en Español, mm -hmm. and it's got three, you know, three different movements. And, mm -hmm. and so it's still being played, but absolutely, let's, let's put it out there. We will, we will, yeah. certainly I will do. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I will just go through some of the photos because it will be set sure. Because here is also a photo when you were playing the piano. How old have you been here? I think I was probably 16 or 17 then. And the piano is still a very important part of my voice. Mm -hmm. it, um, it, and I write musicals. I've always written musical theater, mostly that nobody's ever heard, but that hopefully is gonna change. And then I also write, I've written many one woman shows for the harp as well. Mm -hmm. But that was, before I, that was before I ever was playing the harp at all. Mm -hmm. I think that was still, still four, years, four years from then mm -hmm. was when I first started mm -hmm. playing the harp. And did you like to play the piano? Yeah. Oh my, it was my, it was my, I, that's all I did. All I did as a child and, and as a teenager was play music, make up music, create songs and play them with my friends. And right here, um, this piano, I lived with in a um, collective, a dance collective, a dance theater collective. And so we would often create shows and um, we'd take that huge piano, we would lift that, I don't know, how, it was like a ton. We would take it outside and take it into a field and I would play the music for shows that we would create for the, for the town. You could improvise on the piano already. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, um, I started playing the piano without reading music mm -hmm. when I was three. I mean, you know, just playing stories, stories with music for myself and, um, and, and, and then I started writing songs and my mother taught me how to read chord charts. So mm -hmm. I could read jazz charts. That's how I learned to read music. I couldn't read what was you know, actually written out music, but I could read jazz charts. And that became very helpful to me when I started playing in restaurants because mm -hmm. I could play all these tunes, but I thought it was a sacrilege. I thought I shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. I should not improvise and I should not play jazz and I should not play from chord charts. And then I began to understand, no, that, that was fine. And it was a really powerful skill to have. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually doing a class called um, Lead Sheet Boot Camp at the mm -hmm. Somerset Harp Festival this summer, which is online for the first time. So it's a full day workshop in learning how to read lead sheets because it is such a powerful skill to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I, I feel that the people who can do that has to have the perfect pitch. Do you have the perfect pitch? 
No, no. I still can do it. It's no, really yeah, no, um, no. I have absolutely no perfect pitch. I have okay relative pitch, but not really. But once you understand, so what I do with people, the first thing I do is we psych out the roadmap of a tune, so we know how the tune is moving, what's happening, what keys it's moving through. And one, one amazing thing about the pedal harp with jazz is that if you, if you can shift your harp through the keys with your pedals, mm -hmm. you can have the right notes. The right notes will be there for you to improvise with. Mm -hmm. And then I often suggest that people follow their fingers instead of trying to follow their ears. Mm -hmm to get started and if you're following your fingers you'll be moving and you start to get the sense of what the what the shapes of melodies are and it, you don't have to hit the perfect notes it's about feeling it's, it's about creating that feeling so anyway no you absolutely do not have to have perfect pitch i think that would be terrible what a horrible thing to have well but you know you have wonderful te technique basis, which is, I think, also very important for being a good jazz yes. artist because That's right. without having the good technique, it's really not possible. That's right. I, I mean, I was so lucky to have Linda Wood Rollo as mm -hmm. really my teacher. I, I mean, I had a few lessons with, um, uh, now I can't remember her name, or mm -hmm. when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, now here is here I am with my teacher, Tony. And so this, he is a mime. Um, but he doesn't wear white face and he talks. So I went to Tony when I felt very, very stuck behind the harp. And he was mm -hmm. the first person who started talking to me about mobility. And even, and I think he even brought out a little harp for me to walk around with. And I was like, well, that's not a real harp. You know, I was <laughs> not so snotty at first. Um, but Tony, um, I worked with him for many, many years. And mm -hmm. he helped me to tell stories with the instrument and to be physical. His work was called Physical Eloquence. And when he died, I went again to his wife, who also worked with him, and then I studied with her, and then she and I became, um, you know, sort of colleagues in in creating things together. So he's a very important part of my life. And where he was living in California as well? No, he uh, he was on the East Coast. He had um, a barn in Maine, which still exists, which mm -hmm. is called the Celebration Barn, Celebration Barn Theater, and he taught all kinds of theater skills there. And they are mm -hmm. still taught to this day by one of his protégés. So it's a, it's a, and, and I was teaching performance for musicians there at, at, a, mm -hmm. at, a, at a certain time. And maybe I'll be able to do it again. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. none of us can do that right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. your position was given you by Linda. Yeah, well, no, uh, I actually think it was my teacher before whose name was Pat Pence. And she was my, I had those six lessons, you know, as a kid. And she was the one who was like, do this. Mm -hmm. But I also think that my body is naturally like this because mm -hmm. I noticed that my mother, always her thumbs were out like that. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a natural thing. And one of the most important things that I learned about playing, you know, it's absolutely essential to be relaxing in between everything or mm -hmm. you're, you'll exhaust yourself. And, and, you know, learning to pull my fingers into my hand, and to not stop them with my muscles, but to mm -hmm. let my body stop them. That was a huge principle to learn. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I when I was studying swimming, and my teacher said, if you every movement has a glide, there's mm -hmm. the effort, and there's the glide. And if you are not really engaging in the glide, you're not really doing it. And I think that's what happens when we play the harp, when we play and then we listen and we relax. Right. That is the glide there. Right, yeah, it's very, very interesting because of course your life is so, so full of very, very varied places, you know? So it's- right. That's right. Super, super yeah. nice. I've found also this, tell me something about this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so I'm always shifting from one form to another. And I try, I hired a um a book cover maker. I wanted to make I oh, I got I've got to put this on Baroque Flamenco. This is Baroque Flamenco. 
This uh -huh. is, there's, it, there's actually, it's actually almost like a book cover and it shows the two sides of it because mm -hmm. Baroque flamenco is really about two women. It is about this woman who is like Marie Antoinette and it is about another woman who is like a flamenco dancer. And I, mm -hmm. it's too bad I don't have that picture to show you, but somewhere on my website, mm -hmm. you'll see both of them. Mm -hmm. I often hire artists to help create a visual representation of what I'm mm -hmm. trying to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because often it's hard for me to explain what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. Even in the in Invention and Alchemy, which is this beautiful symphony project of symphony and stories and, move, and, and movement, it's hard for me to explain to people what it is because it's funny. It's, mm -hmm. There's a time when the whole orchestra is dressed up in lab coats. Each piece is a different story. And it's hard to just, there's no name for what that is. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens to me a lot that I conceive of something that seems, well, of course you should do that, but there's no name for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is it the little video, which um, is it also about it? I might, I might bring in it because I think it's I up, yeah. what is interesting. I will just take us off. Yes, that's that's the the one which is coming now on the that's, 10th that's of July. That, yeah, right, that's the one that's coming now, and that's one of the stories in it. And that's the story. It, it it's a it's about the story of Catcher in the Rye, and mm -hmm. um, the, the story it, it combines both the the song coming through the rye and the story, the famous story that it get every American school child reads. I don't know if they read it throughout the world, but of Catcher in the Rye, and it's all about the story of what our place is in the world. And and being able to help others, like the, the, it's about this moment when um, the person in the book is saying, what I want to do in my life is there, there's a big field and children are running through the field, but there's a cliff on the edge of that field and someone needs to catch them so that they don't fall off the cliff. And that's what I want to be. I want to be the catcher in the rise so they can run free and I can catch them. Hmm. And it, it was also inspired by a Celtic harpist named Patsy Seddon and her um, her husband um, who who played the Boran and sang and their romance, the romance of their life, and which was a sad romance because he died very young. And and yet he had so much. Um, he, he he brought so much beauty and power to the world, and I wanted to relive that and bring that alive in that in that piece. Oh, that's great! And it's going to be online, so it's going to be online. So for the very first time, and this is a really interesting story. So once I um, once I started writing for symphony orchestra, I was playing all over the United States, and after one of the shows, I was up on stage. I came down, and a man walked up to me, and he said you know, what I saw out there on the stage, I want the whole world to see. And I was like, that's nice, thank you. What I didn't know is that man was a philanthropist and he became a patron of this project. He asked me to, to present a project. And so I suggested to do a CD and my partner at the time who was the producer said, what, are you kidding? Your show is so physical, it is so visual. You need to make a DVD, you need to make a video. And mm -hmm. I was like, Okay, fine. So mm -hmm. I made the proposal for that. And, and as I was writing it, it was like, it's going to be like this. It's going to bring people closer than the front row. And it's going to be beautiful and all this music. Oh, and I'll, I, I, and it would be great if I got a Grammy nomination. And it would be great if it was on TV. You know, so I had all these things and it came out and it was so beautiful. It, it, everything that I wanted, it brings people closer than the front row. Mm -hmm. And it got a Grammy nomination and it appeared on television. So 
what I wanted to say about this is these projects happen again with alchemy because a patron, there was someone who believed in this. And so they came up and I partnered with them. But I don't think that's what you asked. I think you asked something different and then I went off on this tangent. No, what I, you I'm not. And this is, that's what you oh, said. At the yeah, oh, but here, oh, that, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. But so he said, I want the whole world to see it. Well, it was on DVD, but mm -hmm. after a while DVDs, no, isn't, nobody's buying them. So mm -hmm. this July, this Friday, for the first time ever, his dream is actually coming true. For the first time, he, the whole world can see this. That's great. It, it's amazing. And I think this is what the beauty mm -hmm. of patrons and patronage. I could never have done it without him and without mm -hmm. that symphony. But he saw. And then together we would build this. That's fantastic. Congratulations. And I'm excited to see it. And I'm sure that everyone is excited to see it. And I have here also, if I go back to your past, I found this picture, which oh I know. Oh my God. When okay. I, when yeah. I was a kid, I mean, not kid, but when I was a student, this was my favorite CD. And I had it and also at home. And I was listening to that. Tell us a little bit about that. If it was your first CD or how? No, it was actually, well, I, you know, it's interesting. I made a couple, uh, I made some things on my own. The first CD that I made is called Songs My Mother Sang. And it is a song of children's, literally songs my mother sang and it's children's songs. The second CD that I made, actually, no, I didn't make a CD. The next, it was like a cassette. I had a trio called the Jazz Harp Trio. And we made several different cassettes. But then I was discovered by this label, the GRP label. And this was the third album that I made with GRP. And so this is contemporary jazz. But it was starting to sound a little bit more like me. Uh, but you'll notice that I, on this, it's all instrumental. There were no vocals on this, or maybe just a tiny little bit. And um, you'll also notice the harp. That's a Wurlitzer. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think for the albums, I did not have an electric harp at that time. And I think I was playing a Lion and Healy 23. Mm -hmm. And there was no distortion or anything like that. I was just playing straight harp. Mm -hmm. So no electronic put it in, a, in it. Yet. No, no, not yet, not yet. Not and yet. you know, if you listen to that music, I, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Do, what were the? Do you remember the songs that you liked that were on it? I was listening always through everything because yeah. I really admired that all time. Like yeah. everything what you played, it was just like super, super. Cool. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, and I don't, I don't even remember exactly what's on there. But it, I did, I was starting to explore what might happen with the lever harp on there. There was a tune called Talking Hands mm -hmm. that um, where I started to tell myself the story of, yeah. of, and I started thinking, how could I start building really powerful music that would be playable on mm -hmm. the, the lever harp? Because mm -hmm. I could see that I, I, I could see that had to happen in my future. And it was a very mm -hmm. hard transition going from concert harp to the lever harp. For, for a while, I would always have to bring both to a concert. Yeah. And I made the big switch, I can't remember what year this was, when I was invited to the Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Festival, the mm -hmm. Edinburgh Fringe. And I was going to do a 26 shows in 27 days or something like that. And I thought, this is my chance to get comfortable mm -hmm. with this instrument. So I took only, and it was so, I just took the lever harp. And I remember in the beginning, it's like, whoa, where is this? How do you do this? What's happening? And I had to like, you know, study diagrams at night and I had to put like point, like move this now. Um, <laughs> but I remember by the end of that show, like the, the second to the last show, I was like, okay, I think I finally know how to play this instrument. But that was just the beginning of the relationship. As you know, you know, first you just learn the basic technique, then you're on the journey with that instrument. Exactly. You can be free when you you know how to play. You can really do only concentrate on what you want to do, not about if the fingers will work. That's right. And that's one of the things, since the people in my academy tend to be in two categories. It tends to be um, har harpists who, who, who have a lot of technique, but they mm -hmm. feel very constrained by reading the notes mm -hmm. on the page, or people who have started the harp for the first time in their 60s or 50s or 40s, you know, like mm -hmm. and, like beyond after having another life. Mm -hmm. And the trick for everybody 
is I truly believe that you can create and share a peak musical experience at any level of technical ability if you are resourceful enough to actually use only what you can do. Mm-hmm. And this is where people get lost. They think, mm-hmm. I need this technique in order to express. I need this technique in order to express. Mm-hmm. Whereas in fact, all along the spectrum of who we are, from child through to you know professional, however we go, we can express ourselves absolutely fully Mm -hmm. even if we only had one finger on each hand, if we truly accept that and play within that. And that's part of what I really love to teach people and why I love doing it in a a group situation because people start to be like, oh, I see. That Mm -hmm. person has been playing two years. Oh, but she did that and she was able to express herself. Mm-hmm. And I'm stuck in thinking I have to play blah, 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 blah to express myself. So that's part of my mission is mm-hmm. to unlock mm-hmm. the authentic player in each player, including me, because that's what I love to mm-hmm. see. Mm-hmm. I, I just want to see the, the person in the music, I, I really believe that the music brings, so I'm an ambassador to the world of imagination and music of me, and my job is to bring that forth. I think it's everybody's job. And, but we often need guidance to mm-hmm. do it because we get lost and we think we need to do something else or whatever. And so I love guiding the students mm-hmm. in the academy or, or the people that I coach because also I learn from them. Because it's something we learn by watching each other come to authenticity mm-hmm. as well as trying it ourselves. We can't do it alone. But it's incredibly, incredibly, really very, very uh, clever information and clever advice for the people because you give them also trust that they can trust themselves, that they can trust to do whatever they they want and it will be still themselves and they will be personality and they can... Right. They, Don't, don't be too shy, you know? Right, and Yana, this is why it's so important to do it within a closed and trusting environment. Because mm-hmm. even someone in your home who thinks they're being helpful and is like, I don't know, it's not, mm-hmm. that's all it takes to just like cut it off. And so it's really important to be in an environment where mm-hmm. someone is pointing out, this is what you are doing. This is where you are connecting. Yeah, and here's how you can take it to the next level, but let's not forget where you are and let's see what you can naturally do and then let's take it take it on. Absolutely. That's really very very and everybody listen because this is so so important to to believe into yourself and to trust really that you can do whatever you can for this your abilities and you will always achieve your target. That's yes, and it's and 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 it's it's harder than you'd think. It mm-hmm. takes it takes it takes a village. It, ta- it takes like I, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I asked him what what is success, and he was like, "Well, you know, success it's such a loaded word. Most people think of the externals of success, you know, financial mm-hmm. success or career mm-hmm. success, but the success of a human being to be authentically themselves." is really love, the love to not give up on yourself. Mm -hmm. And so many times when we are trying to express something, it does not come out the way we want it to. And it, 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 I I often, I don't know if I said this in this interview or another one, it's like when everything comes out slimy, every new birth is slimy. And if you look at a kitten, Did I tell you this? A kitten is slimy. If you looked at a kitten and were you're like, well, that's not a kitten. Kittens are fluffy and fun. That's a, nothing, not a kitten, throw it away. So we have to have somebody there to say, yes, yes, that's it. Here's the kernel. You got the kernel. Now let's go on from there. Otherwise, we're just cutting ourselves off and cutting ourselves off and cutting ourselves off. And I struggle with it too. I need, my, I need, I need help as well. 
So mm -hmm. I get help from others. Mm -hmm. It's not like I have the answer. I, I'm always looking for the answer and then sharing it. No, it's really, I thank you very much for saying that to everybody. It helps. It's so much help, these advices. Yeah. Great. Because I can see here also some of your friends. Ah. <laughs> right, that's Mason, um, Mason Daring. So that was, he's a film uh, composer and I was uh, playing on a film of, of, I don't know who the film was, but um, we were up in his studio and mm -hmm. I was playing for that. So Something that can be the answer of the, of which movie is your favorite? Maybe this movie must be your favorite. <laughs> I don't know. I think I stick, I, st I stay with the movie that I mentioned and I'm really glad she asked that because it reminded me that our hands can listen as well as play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here it's, uh, I uh, found, and I don't know, I can't say who is that because I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, this was really, this was really wonderful. So a lot of times my shows, parents will bring children to my shows mm -hmm. um, and, they'll, and they'll be sitting in the front row. Um, and I think the parents are bringing their children because they'll be like, that's what it looks like. You know, if you're living your dream, you know, look at that person so you can do that. And these were two children that were not only in the front row, but I think they ended up being in the show somehow. They came and did something. And so this was afterwards. Oh, how lovely. And here it's uh, DHC. Right. And live. Yeah. And because I have just got now the message also from Ellery that she remembers watching DHC in Cardiff in 1991 or 1993, loving it. And my father was amazed to see you wearing a leather shirt, skirt, yeah, not right. shirt. shirt. <laughs> he has a couple of your CDs signed and loves listening to them. Thank oh, that's you. great. Well, that's I gotta great. say, you know, I studied with a, a woman um, when I wanted to learn jazz, I got a grant from the National Endowment from the Arts to study with Corky Hale who's a wonderful, wonderful jazz harpist. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things she said to me was, you need to look like you want to sound. And I was like, no, 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 no. I want to go out there in a long black dress and then surprise them in just what I can play. Because I had all this like, no, no, no. And eventually I listened to her and I realized that by dressing differently, it not only was in tune with what mm -hmm. I was doing, mm -hmm. but but it felt daring to me. And if I felt if I felt daring, as long as I wasn't worried that anything was going to fall off, it actually impacted my playing, and it helped mm -hmm. me feel better. And there was another reason, which is I didn't really feel comfortable with my body, mm -hmm. and. I, especially with short skirts, I just felt like, oh, my legs. Ugh. And and then I thought, well, you know what? Get out there with your imperfect body mm -hmm. and show other women that it's okay to be out there. But with... you have such a perfect body. Well, you, know, you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm great at, Yana? I'm, I'm great at hiding the figure flaws. That's my, that's my genius. Um, I mean, we all do, once we inhabit our bodies, huh then it is perfect oh that's so funny that's me in my studio that i don't even know what that's from that's actually this room but years and years and years ago from the facebook i found many oh, pictures. Facebook. Yeah. yeah and i love facebook live oh yeah oh cool oh electric wire that was a, so after in 2011 starting starting after 2008 as when things started really shifting in the economy, I took that opportunity to start writing a series of one woman shows. And the main important thing was it had to make sense for the main character to be wearing a harp. So the first one took place in the waiting room for heaven. It was called, what the hell are you doing in the waiting room for heaven? The second show uh, was Honey, I Shrunk the Harp. And that was where I started out with a 25 foot high harp and then I shrunk it down. I love that. And then Electra's Liar. And that was a beautiful story because it was about the story of Electra who, um, you know, I don't know if you know the story of Electra, but it's the, the, the most violent past you can imagine. Her father murdered her sister and then her mother murdered her father. And, you know, it was terrible. And just imagine if you're coming from that past. And all she has is her father's, oh no, her father starts it all by killing a, a, a deer in the, in the forest of Diana. 
and then the curse, blah, 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 blah. So all she has left to her is these instruments of violence. She has a bow and a dagger. That is all she has. And to make sense of her life, she just has the trauma and she goes searching for herself and her meaning. And what she finally comes to is that she takes the bow and she uses the dagger to unravel the one string of the bow. And then she restrings it as a lyre, as a harp. And finally, she is able to take that violent past, deconstruct it and rebuild it as an instrument that she can play. Mm -hmm. And that is the story of Electra's lyre. And are you still doing this? this uh you know, it's so funny. There's, I actually have a, a ver I, I, I am not doing it right now, but I would love to. And mm -hmm. once COVID-19 happened, mm -hmm. I was like, well, I have all these one woman shows I could be doing, but mm -hmm. everything has happened so fast with mm -hmm. this, the premiere of this. And then I'm working on another musical. It's, it's bizarre mm -hmm. that all this stuff has opened up and all these people came into the Academy and, you know, so it was just mm -hmm. like, Mwah. but yes, I would love to be doing it. Certainly, because you have so many projects. Here is also one of the uh, your your titles or yeah. your creativities. Yeah. What's yeah? And here is also another show. <laughs> that's fun. That's funny. Yeah. That's right. These are. I mean, this was just a Mother's Day show. I really loved doing Mother's Day shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so my hair was very long in the video, and it was um, it was all um. It was not real hair. Like I, I would just, you know, put it into my head. Um, and then there came a point at which I realized it was like pulling out my actual hair. And so I was like, let me cut this all off. And it was a very interesting transition uh -huh. because I had become so known as mm -hmm. this, you know, artist with this wild hair, and the hair had become such a big part of my movement. I mean, it was just this color. Mm -hmm. And when I videotaped myself afterwards, because that's what I do to, to rehearse, to practice, I video, mm -hmm. and I discovered that I wasn't really moving my body. I was just moving my head, my hair. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was really great. And you'll see some pictures on my website. I don't know if you have them. After that, I started getting much more physical, physical. There are there are photos when I'm like down on the ground and like my my arms are out and and I'm I'm thinking am I going to be able to get back up but it but it's a beautiful dramatic photo there's from this same photo shoot I think yeah oh no it's from a different one but um and these were all taken at shows after a certain point I I did not do photo shoots people would come to my shows and I remember seeing this photo right afterwards mm -hmm. and I was like oh that's beautiful <laughs> let's mm -hmm. take that one and um, then there's other photos on my website where you can see that once I cut the hair, mm -hmm. I just started really getting much more into the center. Mm -hmm. And it was it was really an interesting experience to mm -hmm. literally cut off something mm -hmm. that had become so identified with me. And mm -hmm. to think, how do I don't how do I go into the future that way? Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, mm, and I and I always loved that hair because people would touch me. Like I would go mm -hmm. in the airport and you know everybody would just like touch me and they'd talk mm -hmm. to me. And, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, man, that's the end of that. <laughs> but then I discovered that that I would always wear these cowboy boots with like sparkly things on them. Mm -hmm. And apparently it wasn't just my hair. And um and, and I felt like I still was able to connect with people and mm -hmm. know that I could let that go, that we can let go of these things we think are us and that we think define mm -hmm. us. And mm -hmm. what happens is we get closer and deeper mm -hmm. to who we are by doing that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be relief for some people, yeah? yeah, because they can really find, as you said, they can find themselves. That's right. And I mean, I, I wouldn't say it was a relief. It, it was scary, mm -hmm. scary to go out. And 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 there was a growing a growing depth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. little by little. But the big moment was when I when I videotaped myself and I saw, okay, you had come to rely on that mm -hmm. hair to create the the impression of movement, and mm -hmm. now it's time to really embody that movement. But you look gorgeous with any hair. So that, that's, that's Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, that's really cool and. 
I mean, I think we, I think we all, I think when we're embodying ourselves and when we're really there, mm. it, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see anything or anyone who's actually there in that mm. moment completely. Absolutely. Yeah. I will show one more of the pictures here. It's also probably now from, from time of the COVID. Is right. It? That's right. Yeah. That's, that's actually, that's really cool. So I, once COVID started, once COVID came in, I like it, like we invited it in. Um, I, I just immediately, I thought, wait a minute, people, people are going to feel isolated. We need to connect. And mm -hmm. so I created uh, a program called uh, Harp Time Live where it was just a free program for everybody to just meet twice a week and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we just play. I set up a groove or I teach some technique, something very simple, and we play and we play and we play. And one thing that's been very interesting in the last couple of weeks, now that people have been doing this for almost three months, is I'll come on and I'll say, okay, what do you guys wanna to do today? And twice people have said, let's write a song together. And I'd be like, okay. And somebody else said, let's, um, I wanna learn power chords. And I was like, okay. So we're gonna learn, we're gonna make a song using power chords. If you, can, if you go to Harp, if you sign up for Harp Time Live, you can actually see this particular um, episode. So mm -hmm. I mean, I'll put it up later on this afternoon because we just did it. So I started with a power chord and then we ended up as a group creating this song that we could mm -hmm. sing. And then we all just sang it and played it. Now, nobody can hear anybody else. And at first I felt like, oh, that's how you work. And then I realized that's the liberating factor. Mm -hmm. Nobody can, they can only hear me. They play mm -hmm. along, they can play up a storm. Doesn't matter if they're playing the right notes or the wrong notes. And we keep doing it over and over. So they get the feeling of it. And that is the liberation. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to hear you. You can just be free. Mm. So that's what that that's what that is a video from. That's great, and you are doing it regularly now, every every day or. Yeah, every that's right. I mean, there I may not do it this coming week because of um, because I'm preparing for the premiere. But mm. people should go and sign up now because you can go back and all the episodes for the last three months are all there, and you can take them. And it says, you know, this is this, this is Calafipso, this is where we. There was one where we learned. I think we did Baroque flamenco, but a very simple version of it. So there's, you can go and see all of those, Sometimes. and you can you can get, you can get that right from my website, or if it's not right on the front page of my website, if you go to my events page, it'll be listed there because it's mm -hmm. an event that happens every week. You can see the web page again. It's going there on the banner. So just right. read it and just contact. Right. That's right. and, if, and if you ever can't find something, just go to the contact page and I think there's an ask a question link or something and you can just email and I, I'm you, not always fast at getting back, but I try to get back and you can always just remind me again. Super. And here is also your wonderful picture. Oh. There you have the jacket, <laughs> the leather jacket. My leather jacket, yeah. And that I believe was in the Netherlands. I think it was at a jazz festival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Oh, and that was a, I don't have that harp anymore. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I know why, because Kamak gave it to me for that concert. Okay, right. When you, have, when you mentioned Kamak, we have Jacques. Right. Here. Yes, 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 yes. I, oh, and look at that guy in the back. That's really cute. <laughs> the way back. I mean, Jacques has been a huge factor in my, in my life. And mm -hmm. if you watch my TEDx talk, um, if you go, I think it's, well, you can just see it. You can go to my site. Even if you, 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 you will stumble on it if you were on my site. If you go to the videos, um, you'll see my TEDx talk. And it's all about the development of the DHC harp, mm -hmm. which is named after me, which I'm really proud of. And it's, it tells the whole story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And here I found also this beautiful picture. Yes, that is backstage at Tanglewood with Ray Charles and Seiji Ozawa. I had opened for Ray Charles and I was thinking, wow, this is crazy. I'm just a solo harpist opening for Ray Charles, but it absolutely worked. That's one of the powerful things about an electric instrument is that I was able to do that with just a solo harp. 
That's amazing. Tell me, what did he say? Did he? He was amazed, isn't? He? Well, he, he was. He was thinking more about his show that was about to come up. But we got to meet, and and he was really lovely. I mean, and both of them were absolutely lovely. Imagine seeing Ray Charles and Seiji Ozawa at the same moment. Fantastic. That's yeah, really amazing. I was so happy to find this picture also because I said like, wow, that's really something so wonderful to, to have. And now I found also this one. Is right. it from the past or is it just now recent? Um, this is fairly recent. So Creative, Creative Resonance is actually a project that I'm working on. It's mm -hmm. also called Strings of Passion. It mm -hmm. is the seven principles that will take you from creative impulse to creative expression. And if you go on my site, there's actually a, a beautiful video um, that combines a concert with talking about these seven principles. So the seven principles are the principle of impulse when you're touched by something or you want to touch. And then the second principle is this principle of structure. We always have to have a structure, an internal structure to anything that we create. The third principle is character. So we want to we want to express our character with what we're doing. So even if you just have the impulse, the impulse of an idea and some kind of a structure, whether it's a story or whether you're thinking rondo form or sonata form, you know, it's just some kind of structure and character. Mm -hmm. You can express yourself creatively. And this is something that I have a whole, I have a whole, you know, seven week class on. But then when you want to work with others, you have to start looking at the idea of roles as you start differentiating the parts of music. So we start thinking about the roles of bass, accompaniment, and melody. That once you know these three roles, you can start arranging, you can start playing with others. You can say, okay, you're gonna play the bass, you're gonna play accompaniment, you're gonna play melody. And jazz is based always on these roles. And what's powerful about roles is that once you have identified roles, like any baseball player can play with any baseball player anywhere in the world whether they speak the same language. Any chess player can play with any chess player in the world. Mm -hmm. And any jazz player can play with any jazz player in the world because they know the role that they're playing at the time. And when you know that role, you can also switch the role. And of course you can expand it and alter it and mm -hmm. substitute. But you, so, so you have, so the roles are the very first part of where you start opening up to others. Mm -hmm. The next string, the, four, uh, the, uh, the fifth string is the string of practice. And we have two ways of looking at practice. And one is you practice to get something the way you want to get it. You know, we're all mm -hmm. used to that. Put on a metronome and practice until you get it. Mm -hmm. But we also have a practice. When we meditate as we're playing or we play something over and over, we let it get to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the two parts of practice that start integrating. So we start off with an impulse. And then we have a structure, whatever that is. Story is the easiest structure. We, we add character to it. We break it down with roles. And then we start having a practice that starts integrating it into us. The next string, the sixth string, is the string of deconstruction. So right now I'm deconstructing the idea. When, when, I'm, when I give a class, like I'm giving a class right now called One Song, The Nightingale, where I where I break the whole song down into basically one page of a drawing so you can see how it's all constructed. So it's a deconstruction. Once you do that, you can recreate it in infinite ways. You can recreate it as a song. You can recreate it in different keys. You can recreate it as a chamber ensemble piece. You can recreate it as a story. You can recreate it as a, you know, or reinvent it as these things. So you've got those principles, impulse, structure, character, practice, deconstruction, no, roles, roles, and then practice and deconstruction. And finally, the point of all of that is the moment of liftoff. Mm -hmm. And that is the moment when you stop trying to break it down. You stop trying to find out what it is. You stop trying to practice it. You actually embrace everything you are and everything you aren't everything you can do and everything you can't do. You embrace where you are and you let the music come through you. It's not the moment of, of making it perfect. It's the moment of letting it be what it is and letting you be who you are. That's mm -hmm. lift off. And so the, those, I love to break things down in those seven principles 
Because then what happens, what I discovered is that then when you're working that way with your instrument, an instrument starts to build inside of us. Mm -hmm. It's almost like there's a mirror image. And mm -hmm. who we authentically are is then resonated in how we are performing. And that mm -hmm. resonance starts to go back and forth. And what mm -hmm. we're doing begins to make us more authentic. And us being authentic makes our playing more authentic. And that mm -hmm. is what I call creative resonance when mm -hmm. what we are doing is who we are and what and who we are is what we're doing amazing great really this is so super super great absolutely great imaging super thank you and this also brings me the the one of the comment which we got from shionette oh Sharon! <laughs> she was one of the oh my god she was so great she brought me to edinburgh uh, is that where no, London, she brought me to London and we did this really wonderful jazz project together. And I will never forget, wait a minute, let me, do I remember some harpists were having a hard time with me arranging the first ever jazz class with you and Trinity students and the brilliant, yes, yes, yes. It was amazing, Seanad. I loved working with you. I mean, she'd do it again. And I just want to show you one more, one more message from her because oh, she also... I know the very long time you came to our home, Deborah. I do. I remember that. Of course, I do. And what was amazing about working with Sean Ed is um, there was also um, a, a man there who had arranged something for a, a harp ensemble, and it, it was it was really mind boggling. I mean, it was really beautiful, and it was just about changing harmonies. And I wish I could, I, I would love to go back there and do that again. I, it was, yes, it was so fun to work with her. I, I, had, I feel like I've had so many amazing life experiences with other harpists. Mm -hmm. So that it's not just the harp, but it is harpists. And, you know, I realized this, like at one point I was like, huh, that's interesting. Now harpists, they're mostly women. They're independent. They have often have their own businesses. They've figured out how to get this humongous, delicate instrument around. No wonder I think they're wonderful. You know, that there is this, it's, you see the harpist on the stage or something and you're like, oh, harpist on the stage, long gown. But everything that goes into doing that, having their own businesses, um, you know, learning to have a practice. And, and the biggest thing for me was, I don't know if you know Louise Trotter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to me, when I saw her get that harp all over the place, and I, mm -hmm. I, I think she was in her 70s at the time, and I was like, whoa, this is resourcefulness at a deep mm -hmm. level. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, and yeah. you have the example of, of the person who is so open, like heart open to everyone. And I think that this is also the, as you were talking about the music, that what you are giving, it's shown in the music and what is coming back you, it's like reverse. It is exactly with you because you are such a person. So that's why you have so many wonderful experiences also with the harpist, you know, because they really, they, they take you as you are. And this is what is reflexing, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's been a really beautiful, mm -hmm. it, I think it be, because I wasn't in, I, I don't play what other people play, so I'm not competing with anybody. Mm -hmm. I it, it it gave me a, a comfortable place to be, and I began discovering that we are this worldwide community of players, builders, publishing companies, mm -hmm. and all the people and and the and the the people who love harpists and carry their harps around the, it's this it's this beautiful community that is this beautiful ecosystem mm -hmm. and seeing them at festivals and it, i began to realize this is something really special that i'm so grateful to be a part of and the people who create festivals it, it's an, it's amazing Absolutely. And you are you are the one who should never be missed, honestly, because you are really like a shining and sh sparkling uh, lady, you know, with everything what you do. And you always come with a new creativity and you are the inspiration for everyone. So it's really something you have never been missed. You have to be always. Well, thank you. I, I love being there. I love being in the center of it. And I love collaborating. I really love collaborating. 
on new projects. And uh, if I can show, this is also a beautiful <laughs> picture. Right, that's a new picture. Um, yeah, I think I was just, at, I think I was at the end of a webinar or something, and mm -hmm. I was just looking at the looking at the camera, and I was like, you know what? That's right. I just want to look straight into people's eyes. Mm, that's, that's wonderful. And this is picture, which is now exactly with the same background, which you exactly. Mean. That's right. That's right in this. In, that's right in my studio. Mm -hmm. And here's also your academy. Right. That's right. So there is also the web page, so you can show. Right. Uh, yeah, if you go to if you go to hipharpacademy.com, you can see all the different classes that mm -hmm. are in the academy. And this mm -hmm. is actually a really great time to join. And uh -huh. um and 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 when you join, you're in for the whole year, and you get access immediately to all the classes. So some people like to go along with the um, with with other people they like to be learning together and having mm -hmm. chats um and some people just want to go in and they just want to get the information and just come to the chats sometimes mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. a very vibrant community within the within hip harp academy so we have chats once a week but also there's a wonderful woman ann horton who has been in the academy for about three years so i have student liaisons and she's one of the student liaisons and she mm -hmm. um she hosts a salon, a social salon after the chats where people from all around the world can just stay and talk to each other. So I leave them on my computer and I go off and I take a run and I often come back and they're like talking for an hour and then they're talking for two hours. And I believe that's a really important part mm -hmm. of learning in a community is mm -hmm. to be able to connect with people Mm -hmm. through the classes, but also outside of the classes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one thing that's beautiful about when you're in university, you get mm -hmm. to have these relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised to discover that that started happening in my academy. At first I was just teaching people and then I started to realize, no, no, this is a community. And now they have a life of their own. Oh, now they're pushing this, now they're starting. And it was really fascinating because mm -hmm. when I did this new class called One Song, The Nightingale, the students, and you can see it in the, in the if you see the videos afterwards, they'll be like, okay, well, we liked when you did this and then um, this was kind of confusing. So next time, can you do this and can you do this and can you do that? And they, they've really helped to shape how mm -hmm. it's working. And you can see it. Like the first time I was doing it, it was kind of confusing. And then later and later, it gets more and more clear mm -hmm. because of them. It's and how often do you do this academy? It's every week or how often? Are so the, the, the academy is running all, all year. Once mm -hmm. a week, we so they're they're in like right they're right at the end of the blues class there was a class they took for seven weeks called blues harp style where they mm -hmm. learned how to create blues and then at the end of every class there's a project so they created a project in blues mm -hmm. and then they got my feedback i give them video feedback for for what mm -hmm. they did and now they're working on the final project so they will finish those final projects on monday and every monday we meet and it's a chat where I'm answering questions and talking to them. And, um, and, 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 but they also have this, these projects that they're doing. And it's a huge, that's a huge part of the academy is people taking what they're learning and applying it directly to their repertoire mm -hmm. at, at whatever level they are. And you will see people who are barely playing, but, mm -hmm they know how to take it and put it into the format of a story or in the format of a meditation. And then you have people who are incredibly talent, you know, they have incredible chops and they're learning how to build tone poems out of the blues or, or other things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's really beautiful to see people of many different levels mm -hmm. taking the same concepts and creating things that will speak for them mm -hmm. and will connect to their audience. So it, it, it's, yeah. it, it's, about, it's about learning about music. It's about getting liberated from the page. Mm -hmm. It is also about learning to build your repertoire mm -hmm. with improvisation. So it's all about freedom and all the things that support freedom, the structure, mm -hmm. the deconstruction, mm -hmm. learning about those roles, learning about those things so that you can apply mm -hmm. them to your music and then you can be authentically who you are. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And is there any video on YouTube which they can see how the lessons look like, the people? Who that's, would like really, to that's a really great, that's a really great question. Um, there's a little bit of video. If you go to Hip Harp Academy, you can mm -hmm. see, um, I don't know what I showed there. It would be, and there are also absolutely some, um, some videos of the students' final projects. Mm -hmm. I think if you went to my blog and you typed in blues or final project, I always call them final beginning project because mm -hmm. it's really the beginning of the next part of their journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that would be great. I mean, if somebody wanted to see what it was like, you, you should definitely come to Harp Time Live. That would give you a sense of what my teaching is like. And you can also join a single class like the night one song, the nightingale. Um, and it, but it, but there, it really, you're right. It is the academy experience of being with everybody and getting mm -hmm. that individualized attention that's mm -hmm. really powerful. Because mm -hmm. I learned, I tried to learn things online, and yeah. I found that the, I always had questions. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. But how do I apply this to me? Like. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can't do that. How do I apply it to me? And that's why it was so important for me to always have this live component of the academy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'm sure that the people maybe can really find on YouTube. You said that they have your channel so that they can look for your channel and they, they can look for my channel. They probably won't see much about the academy because I, mm -hmm. I part of what I try to do is keep it um, safe. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm rarely sharing unless the students say, yeah, you're you're welcome to share this. Of course, yeah. But I'm sure you you will not make a mistake when you sign right. in. And that's right. That's right. And, <laughs> and if you go to Hip Hop Academy, you'll see it. And you, then you can always ask me questions. I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> and to come to your little private life, I see oh, that. Oh, <laughs> that's Pooks, the great Pookarini. Hmm. Yes, yeah, he does not look very happy in that moment. <laughs> He wanted to make a photo, the selfie with you, and was not happy about it. How does he? It's him, yeah. It's him. Yeah. Well, I have two cats, a, a female uh -huh. and a male. Yeah. And how they they like when you are traveling? Do you take them with you, or they? Uh, they <clears throat> when I'm traveling, it's mm -hmm. they have a cat sitter who they love. They really mm -hmm. love their cat sitter, um, who comes and stays here. But that's the hard, that's really hard. I have a garden and I have cats, and in my garden I have like blueberries and raspberries and blackberries and tomatoes. And it's really hard to leave home for a long time when I feel like I'm going to miss my garden. And mm -hmm. I also, I mean, I, I gotta say, I think I miss my garden more than my cats, but I, but I, I like them both. But the cats, the cats can have a, I know the cats are happy because they really love their cat sitter. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your child, I forgot to ask, did you have a siblings or are you the only child? No, I have a brother and my brother is really fascinating. I actually have a, a brother. I have two half sisters, two stepsisters and a stepbrother. And mm -hmm. so I have a big family from a lot of marriages. My brother, Jonathan Conant, is um, he is amazing. He has a he created a trapeze school called Trapeze School New York. And what he does is he, he helps people. Now I think he, he lives in Costa Rica and he has a, a retreat um, where people can learn to fly on the flying trapeze. Not as a, not to join the circus, but as, as an expression of freedom, as an, a way to feel free. And I think mm -hmm. I, when I look at what he does, with the flying trapeze and I look at what I do, I realize that both of us have this need, well, we both love flying and, um, and the idea of flying, oh, well, I have to talk about that in a second, but we also both love the, the just the helping people experience liberation. Can you, can you pull that picture up again? That is my favorite food. I have written a song about watermelon. I love it so much. I've got in my refrigerator now, I have all this watermelon. And yep, that's me as a little kid with my <laughs> favorite food. Yeah, yeah, because I have never found any picture of you with anybody like like a sibling. So I thought like maybe you did not have anyone, but that's really when you were saying flying. Well, I you said, know what? Okay, thank you. I should, uh, I do have a couple pictures of me with my brother and I should put them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, you're right. That's so, so funny. Really nice. And uh, here we have also another that you have right. use. Right. So I have a I have a mentorship program which is going to open up back again in the fall. 
um, and it's called Harness Your Muse. And it's for artists who have a dream that they want to realize, whether it's a show or it's an album or it is a, um, a publication, they want to make a shift in their career and they need support in making that shift in their career. So Harness Your Muse is a mentorship program, a high level mm -hmm. mentorship program. And this is a webinar where I took people on a meditation to actually meet their personal muse. So there, I have a whole lot. If people join, they can join. There's a free level of the Academy, actually. If you go to my website, hipharp.com, I think if you go into store, there's probably something that says free stuff or some, somewhere there's a thing that says free stuff. You can um, log in to the free level of the academy and see a lot of webinars. That one may be one of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I, I'm just like impressed how many projects you have. And it seems like you need to have hundreds of life to be able to do all of it. <laughs> it's really amazing. And oh, so that's amazing. Well, all of them come out of the, sa the same three things. I think mature artists, um, so when we're in that mature part of our lives, I think we have three parts, and that is the performer, the creator, and oh, no, so the, the performer, publisher, you know, performing and publishing our works, um, creating new works, and then, no, sorry, creating and publishing, that's it, performing, and then teaching. So you always have those three parts where you're where you're creating more work and you're making it available to people. You're out there performing and you're teaching. And mm -hmm. it's not, a, I don't think it's unusual. I mean, if you look at any university, you will see that they, those teachers may be teaching, but they're also creating and they're also out there in the world performing. So what, I'm, I'm not at the university, but I'm just doing it in, in my own way. What do you like the best for you? I, I mean, you certainly like everything, but what is your most favorite? Do you most uh, like to perform in front of people or give the advices or everything is on the same same balance? So which is, of course, always but the best. It, It's so funny because I don't think of it as giving ad advice. I think of it as exploring with my students. Um, I didn't know that I would love teaching. And I didn't know how powerful an effect it would have on my own performing. And my relationship with my students it, as, a, it, as a group, because it's a group community, community is, is has really changed my life. my life. I look back at collaborations that I had that changed my life, like my collaboration with Kamak. Mm -hmm. created a new instrument that that never was. That was a beautiful collaboration. My collaboration with Peter Weggy, who was this, the patron who made Invention and Alchemy happen. That was a beautiful collaboration. And also the producer and the director who I worked with mm -hmm. there. And I recently asked myself, well, when is my, you know, what's my next, you know, life-changing, transforming collaboration? And I realized, well, I, I'm already in it. It's the relationship with the people in the academy and the people who are in my mentorship programs because that's the next step of deconstructing what I do. And as I can deconstruct it for them, I become much more aware of what I'm doing. And so that's really beautiful. So it, it has impacted my performing to a huge degree. I'm performing very differently than I have before. Mm -hmm. and much more authentically. And um, so it, my relationship with students has impacted my performing. It's impacted my publishing because I'm willing to put more things out there. And um, and then as far as, what was it? Oh, and then it is the teaching. So it holds all those three things. Mm -hmm. And you have your own publishing company, which does it, or do you publish through Kamak or through some other? I, I, yeah, well, I have I have a publisher here in the United States. I'm working with Vanderbilt. They've just taken over because I was published self publishing in the U.S. and we just I could I couldn't handle it anymore, mm -hmm. and so they offered to take it over. And then um, all in the in the in Europe, I work with Creighton Collections, and he's been really great to work mm -hmm. with. And that's another beautiful you know, relationship to have these relationships with people and the relationships with the festivals, I mean, with Canada, mm -hmm. with the festivals, with the publishers, with the stores and, you know, Somerset Harp Festival. I'm about to do, 
they're, they've gone online and I'm about to do my, my um, you know, I, I teach there and, and Invention and Alchemy will be there. But, and I'm also doing this uh, boot camp, uh, Lead Sheet Boot Camp. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done that. It's a full day workshop. I wouldn't have done that without my collaboration with Somerset. Mm -hmm. All these collaborations. And then the Harp Column is also doing a summer camp. And I'm teaching in their summer camp as well. So those, those, it's those relationships yes, yes. that are so important. Yes. And is there any CD which you are planning now to record? Um, well, I'm all excited about, I was, I was looking back here because I think my, uh, my CD is back there. I just released a couple years ago something called uh, the Essential DHC, which mm -hmm. is a compilation one compilation of all my instrumentals that are my favorites and one compilation of all my vocals which are my favorites and that is my cd now like i'm not out performing so it's hard to sell them and cd baby which used to sell cds they're not they're no longer you know doing what they do anymore so mm -hmm. the, one of the great things about um invention and alchemy is that people will actually be able to get both the cd and the dvd for for mm -hmm. a premium um, but I feel like I am, ah, I am, I love to create things and I love to create shows. And the show that I'm working on right now is called The Golden Cage. And it's mm -hmm. actually a musical that I'm not even in, but it mm -hmm. is a, a musical that I started writing years ago and we just started auditioning for it. So that's my next thing. And so mm -hmm. after Invention and Alchemy, that will be the next project. And to me, that, to me, that's exciting. What it will, it will be in August? Um, I don't know how soon it will be because mm -hmm. because of COVID nineteen. Because it has to be done virtually, but it will be released on a a, a, a platform that's called Streaming Musicals, and it's really it's just a musical. I'm not in it, but it's a musical about a bird man who has spent his whole life searching the world for the ultimate symbol of Birdman's security, which mm -hmm. is this golden cage. Mm -hmm. And he's searched everywhere. He finally, finally, he finds it. And it's everything he's ever dreamt of, except for one thing. There is a woman stuck inside it. And she says that it is not a golden cage. It is a prison of cement and iron. He can see that it's a golden cage but it's a different experience for her. Mm -hmm. And so the musical is all about how they deal with that and yeah. their, their different vision of that. We will certainly be informed about this project, right? Absolutely, you yes. Must know, and I will certainly be very happy to share it from your channel. And uh, before we will, of course, uh, be, I just also have one more picture here where you are some, with some band. Yes. Oh, this is, <laughs> um, so there, there's a really famous uh, rock guitarist by the name of Steve Vai. He's a legendary. And uh -huh. he saw me on YouTube and he invited me to join his band for a world tour. And I think that was 2011 or 12 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a picture of during that time. And it's really worth going to my website and looking at the videos because there's a really wonderful video of me playing with him. But before you take that down, look carefully because his um, tech person, it was a huge show with all these lights. I wasn't going to be able to see my strings. And so they mounted a set of beautiful LED lights all around the perimeter of the inside of the harp. Wow. So, yep. So that I could see while I was playing. And it was great. The one bad thing about it was that the battery was like five pounds. So the battery weighed almost half again as much as the harp. That made that a little hard. I know, but they were really beautiful. And um, that's something that I would like to be able to get back on the harp at some point. Mm -hmm. And did it last for the whole concert? The lights lasted for the whole yeah. yeah, they lasted for the whole I think they had to switch the battery out at the intermission. Mm -hmm. And and it was it was great because um I mean the show was like it was loud and and I had to have two harps with me because if a harp had a problem you can't stop and fix the string I would just take it off and the guitar tech would bring me a, a different harp that I could wear it was one of the hardest things I ever did in my life mm -hmm. learning to play his music it was like learning learning to play an opera where none of the notes are written down and you have to you have to figure it all out yourself and I actually hired another harpist to come 
and coach me because I, I couldn't do it myself. Mm. And, and suddenly my brain is not remembering her name, Marta, Marta um, Cook. Mm -hmm. we, I was talking on YouTube, no, I was talking on Facebook. I was saying, look what I have to figure out how to do. And I was like, check this out. And she was like, I think I can help you figure that out. And I mm -hmm. called her up and I said, seriously? I said, like, what are you doing for the next two weeks? And she was like, well, I don't, I don't know. I was like, can you come live with me for two weeks and help me? And she was like, mm -hmm. okay. And so she came and lived with me and helped me to figure out how to do this thing. That's fantastic. Yeah, so again, I could not have done it without the, without the HARP community. Mm. And also at, during that same project, Maeve Gilcrest, mm. I asked her to come and help me learn how to do a lot of the lever techniques that she does. I mean, mm. it's so amazing. Everybody's figuring, learning different things, and then mm. we can share those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. And do you have only one harp, this, this one which we have seen, the, the blue one, or do you have more of them? I have, th I have three of them. And are they different only in colors, or are they different in uh, in uh, the size? Or oh no no no, they're ex exactly they're exactly the same, so that the mm -hmm. harness fits with all of them. Um, they're different colors. They will sound slightly different, but I think it has more to do with the age of the strings. As I play them, um, the sound gets a little um, it, it gets a little more, more mellow, and then when I change the strings, it's more bright again. And mm -hmm. so that will, that will make a difference between them. But otherwise, I want them to be just the same. Mm -hmm. So that I can switch them out. I totally understand. Is there any song which you like the best? And you play the most, like with the most passion, which you really love. And yeah. you can play for us now. Ah, well, I, I actually I actually already played some of some of that um, mm -hmm. when I played. I played before. Um, it, it's called. Um, it's called Cirque du Lune, or it, it's actually called Doña Quixota. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm happy to play it. You you'll be hearing it again. Um, With pleasure. I think that there are more people who came later, oh, so it will be really okay. nice. All right, great. Well, I'm going to take this off so I can. Absolutely. Like, okay. Sure. All right. So. Oh, I'll put this uses the looper. Um, so I'm just going to show you how the looper works before I do this. And I'm in my studio here. <laughs> and I'm wearing shoes I don't normally wear. So I hope I'll be able to do that OK. And I'm, I, I wanna, I'm just going to be back in just a second. I want to just move the, the looper, which is going to move it to make it easier for me to get to. Yes. Okay. Great. Right. So you perfectly. Yeah. And I don't sing it. I don't sing in this song. Mm -hmm. um. So uh, before I start this, I just want to show you how the looper works, so you know really what I'm doing, so that it doesn't seem like magic. So if I were playing a like. Okay, so that's looped. I'm gonna loop that. So now that's all looped in there. Then I can play it over it. So that's the basic technology that you are basically recording as you're playing, and then you can play over it. But there are different things that you can do with it. So you've heard of Don Quixote, who went through the world tilting at windmills and having dreams. But have you heard of Doña Quixota? Who had her own dreams and 
went on her own adventures. And this is the piece of one of her first adventures. It's called Doña Quixota or Cirque de Lune. Thank you. 
more. And of course, as the people also are just like amazed and absolutely, that's very, 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 very true. It was fantastic. Deborah, you are really amazing. You are absolutely a star. And I'm so happy that you made your really very busy schedule for us. Well, you Yara, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm so thrilled to, to do it at this time when I can share something amazing that's just about coming up. Thank you so much. It was just a wonderful pleasure to be with you. Thank you for all your efforts to learn that much and all your wonderful questions and all the beautiful people who were here. Thank you. I thank you really very much. I thank to everybody who was with us and I thank you for your beautiful playing and it was just a really fantastic time with you. And if you allow, I would like to for all of the people who came a little bit later to finish our interview with the same video which I started because of course, as we heard, fantastic playing live you can also see how fantastic and beloved and really so admired our today's guest is. And I'm so honored that we had Deborah Hansen Conant today with us. Thank yeah. you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck for all your projects on the Thank on you. Friday, the July 10th. Yeah. We all have to be online. So we have to listen and look. And I'm very looking forward to that. Yeah. Have a great evening and I'll see you later. Thank okay. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. A musical pioneer. A legend on the stage. A force of nature. Deborah Henson Conant. Her mastery of the heart captivates. Her vocals electrify. Deborah thrills her fans and builds a new fall. Audiences adore her, performing her one-woman shows. I said, you know what? And I said, you know what? what? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Featured as an orchestral soloist. Community. Deborah Henson Conant is a tour de force that must be experienced.